This is going to be a short case study on a project that I worked on at Revision Architecture um, called the Hard Bargain Farm, and it was designed to be a, a living building challenge project, which is very exciting, and it's right here by the Potomac River, and it's on this beautiful farm in this beautiful area that's pretty undeveloped, actually, most forests and farms. And uh, the, the goal of the design team was to, let's see what we got here, preserve this beautiful, pristine ecosystem, but yet build um, more facilities for kids to spend the night, to come to summer camp, and to build spaces for people to interact and have, uh, have experiences on site. This is really the only functional building on site. There's some barns and such. And so um, this is one of the potential areas that we could build on or renovate, which obviously renovating or building on disturbed sites are one of the first principles of sustainability. But there's also lots of other areas to build that have amazing view sheds and, and really opportunities for solar access. And there is a little bit of solar on site right now. Uh, as I said before, there's a couple barns. This is a working farm. Kids come from the city every day to experience farmland and nature, and then they leave at the day. And so the goal here was to provide some nighttime accommodations for kids who may be not exposed. Now, we talk, when we talked about sustainable sites, we talked about uh, pre-design process and site inventory and analysis. And a couple things that were really important here is that um, this was that building that I showed you earlier up here on the hillside surrounded by trees, not a lot of light, and a lot of water flowing underneath this building. And then we have over here in all these areas lots more land um, with lots of access to sun. So if we're trying to do a living building challenge, which wants to get 105% of its energy, this building right here is not going to allow us to do it. So we're going to have to look for something a little bit more sophisticated in this project. So um, one of the things that we do as sustainable designers early on is we do solar studies with these, um, oh gosh, I'm really losing it. I forget the name of these. These, pathfind these are solar pathfinders. And you see the yellow is the tracing of what is going to be 80% available during the year for solar. It's a great site for solar right here. And then if you look up here, though, you see that there is very little access, really just at the middle of the day in certain seasons to get light there. So we have a problem. We don't really want to build down in this meadow, but we need to get a lot of energy generation on our building. A little bit of the touchstones. And when we do sustainable design, we always do guiding principles. We'll be covering this in a couple of weeks. You see here that these are the goals that as we design the project, we'd come back and use these to decide if we did a good job or not. Not sort of, I hate to say it, random or arbitrary ideas about what makes good design, but actually client-driven, stakeholder-driven parameters for quality design. We used a, a five-day design charrette, which means we stayed down there a lot, stayed in hotels. And uh, on the first day, we developed alternative plans. And again, I'll be covering this in great detail in a couple weeks. Um, we, we then get a lot of stakeholder engagement. We redesign on day three. We get more stakeholder engagement. And on day five, we redesign again. Again, this is real-time live design with stakeholders. And in day seven, we present it at a public meeting and see what happens. Um, and so there's, there's obviously what the process looks like. Not, not surprising, a lot of the old trace. That's uh, Jose Amanana, a landscape architect at Andrew Pogon. That's me back in the old days uh, when I was a lot younger. And one of the things that we did before we drew anything is we spent a lot of time walking the site. And this is something I think is unique amongst sustainable designers is to really come to grips with what does it really mean to put a building in an ecosystem on a site that has its own natural context. And then we go draw and we draw and we draw and we draw and we draw a lot. And we thought a lot about that building up there on the hill. We thought a lot about the need to renovate and expand that building to minimize the impacts on the farm. But we also thought about view corridors and how we could see to and from. And finally, um, in terms of looking at nature for inspiration, the idea of biomimicry, or at least biophilia, actually biomimicry in this case, studying the vegetation on the two sites, the meadow site, which was grassy, and then the upper hill site with the existing building, which was mossy. And so nature tends to form itself based on what's available. So moss being in the shade and being wet grass being in the sun and being relatively dry could then begin to generate a concept or an approach for these buildings. And so there you have it. So grass being a building that opens up to the sun and then moss being a building that collects water. And what if these, each of these buildings then would feed each other? So the grass building would feed sun to moss and moss would feed water to grass. A pretty simple concept, but 
not simply developed, actually. Here's the, what ended up happening on the design project. These were not done in the charrette, obviously. You have, just to orient you a little bit more, here's the access road that brings you up into the site. We did add some more parking, and there was a lot of fights about parking and where that could go. There's a beautiful dock that goes out into the water here so people can get wet. There is a grass building, which is for public functions like receptions and classes. And then there's the moss building, which has cabins and overnight capabilities um, for that. And then additional solar panels to get to net zero energy or 105% energy. Here's a little blow up of the site of construction. And uh, here you see again the, the um, sun building or the grass building and then there's the moss building with some of these things hanging on. I'll explain what those are. Those are cabins. And now what I'm going to do is show you some of the living building challenge imperatives and how they played out in the design. So the first thing is responsible site selection, no impact on sensitive lands. We were able to do that in this project. Limits to growth. So we tried to build on previously developed sites. <coughs> it turns out this had been developed in the past and was not what we would call a pristine natural site, although it had some qualities. Uh, we did set aside um, habitat for, for um, in a trust, so it couldn't be developed in the future. Net zero energy, now 105% of energy, and that's coming from that and some additional solar panels. The red list was really the biggest challenge on this project, is specifying materials without all those chemicals that I showed you in the last video. Uh, purchase offsets for carbon construction, which, which occurred, so um, <coughs> really minimizing the Exposure to construction vehicles on this project was, was also pretty critical. Uh, we used FSC or salvaged wood, Forest Stewardship Council wood. We had um, local materials within 100 miles. We had a 90% construction waste reclamation. That's actually the dumpster there, by the way. We had net zero water, so no impact on the aquifer, meaning that all of the rainwater that hits the site stayed on the site, and you see some blueness here. There's a lot of work on rain gardens and other landscape elements to try to move water from up here down to here in a, in a meaningful way. Um, no impact on wastewater systems and uh, lots of fresh air and daylight for everybody. And then, of course, lots of ventilation in the building, which was eventually going to be added on to. And then, of course, respect for culture and history of the place, which really drove a lot of the charrette. Some of these stakeholders did not want to have a building here. They love that meadow. Um, and that was really what happens in Charette's is a lot of arguments. And then finally, education and, and inspiration. This place is going to be an educator. So the uh, grass building raised up off the ground to minimize its impact on the earth. Not, no big giant foundations. Lots of solar exposure, but also a way to get some fresh air moving in and out of this building. And that is um, some other views of the building, the sun building. This is the other building that looks kind of unrecognizable, but these are actually additions. Uh, this big glass living room, which is this in section, is um, looking out the views to Mount Vernon. And the uh, concept here was to put cabins in the sky where children could sleep in bunks and look out and experience the canopy and, and the natural area of the site. It's a rendering of um, what the, what the uh, grass building will look like, and you see a lot of stuff here. I'll talk about that in a minute. You're going to see some stormwater mitigation work being done there. You're going to see some stormwater mitigation. These are rain gardens. But you really clearly see that this building is collecting water and sending it down to here for the functioning of these bathrooms, and this building is collecting sun and sending energy up there. That's the concept. Um, so there you see some of the rainwater collection strategies. So not only are we... Um, uh, using rain gardens, but we're collecting water for flushing of toilets, which is required for a living building challenge, and even using composting toilets in many, many parts, especially the cabins. So that's a zero water toilet, which is pretty, pretty good. And uh, then we're going to talk about stormwater management strategies. Green roof um, is a little at odds with the team on that one, but um, that's okay. We got to try to um, use these sustainable technologies where we can. A lot of rain gardens, which allows water to get back into the site rather than going off site. And those rain gardens, you can see, kind of find their way down here. So this is the low point of site. So there are bioswales and rain gardens moving water down in a very slow way onto the site. And probably one of my favorite parts is the boardwalk, which is under construction at this time to try to get people out in connection with nature. And one of the important things was to get handicap access out there onto that site. 
So that is a very short case study on a living building challenge project. You see the numbers there. You can always reach out to them or you can ask me questions in the forum.